Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zia's Caravalla from ZK Research, and I'm joined today by Ray Sumaro. Ray, you are the GM for Technology and Innovation at the Melbourne Cricket Grounds. Uh, Ray, thank you so much for joining me. I'm delighted to have you on as you're doing some great things there down under. Uh, before we talk about some of the technology, though, just a quick introduction on yourself, but also talk about the Melbourne Cricket Club. I know while the name is cricket, it's actually much more than that. Thanks, Zia. Yes. Um, my role at the Melbourne Cricket Ground is the GM of IT and Innovation. So my portfolio spans anywhere from the network to Wi-Fi to IPTV to security to building management systems and broadcast. So it's a wide variety that, that can falls under my portfolio. And as you rightly mentioned, the, we manage the Melbourne Cricket Ground. So the Melbourne Cricket Ground has a capacity of just over 100,000 fans. And we have close to 3.8 million fans that visit us every year. Our, our biggest sporting code that we host is the Australian Football League, which is the AFL. And we have 47 games of AFL per season, plus the finals, plus the grand final at the MCG. And then we'll have 10, 10 games of cricket, international cricket per year. And on top of that, we host various concerts. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Give me a sense of the total seating capacity. Just how big a facility are we talking about here? So we we our sitting capacity is hundred thousand and twenty six to be precise. Wow, one hundred thousand and twenty six. Yes. <laughs> and so that's a massive facility. I assume though it varies for concerts and sporting events, and uh, actually can get a little bigger than that. That's correct. So with a concert, depending on the, how the stage is set up. So for we hosted Ed Sheeran here in March twenty twenty three. And for the Ed Sheeran concert, we had 106,000 in the stadium every night, which is different to when we had Taylor Swift earlier this year. She did three concerts here, and because of a stage setup, we had 96,000 each night. Wow, that's remarkable, Ray, at 100,000 per night. That's like having cities inside your facility at MCG. Uh, as that's the case, tell me about the various types of services that you need to provide across concerts, sporting events, and all the different types of events that you hold at the MCG. So, so we cover everything from, you know, our, our fans are like any other fans. You know, they they once they get into the stadium, they like to be told where to go. So it's wayfinding, and then then you know seamless ingress. So we do hundred percent of scanning when people come in. But then there's food and beverage that we have to offer to them, plus being engaged with the, the friends who are not here. So connectivity is priority for anyone attending the games. Thanks, Ray. I want to shift now and talk about the network. I recently conducted a study and asked about the network, and it's important to business operations today. And 93% of my respondents said that the network was more important to the business than it was just two years ago. And I haven't met a sports and entertainment CIO that doesn't agree with that sentiment. So I'm guessing you will too. So Talk to me a little about that. Well, first of all, do you agree with that sentiment? And second, can you tell me about the role of the network and how it's changed during your tenure? Yeah, that's a great question, Zias. Look, if you ask my board a few years ago that said the most important infrastructure was the playing field or the arena. And now very close second to that is our network as the dependency on the network is to allow us will allow us to open the stadium and host an event. Without a network, we cannot do that. Because from, from our entry point, from our security management, from our building management system, broadcast, team communications, and opening up food and beverage outlets is all dependent on a network being available. We cannot, we cannot start a game without a network being fully operational. So just imagine the network not being stable or operational the brand damage that will do to the MCG is huge. Yes, I would certainly agree with that. And I imagine in your industry, brand is everything. Staying on that topic, can you describe how you've seen the services and bandwidth requirements change if we roll back the clock, say five years or so compared to today? What was a typical concert or sporting event like? I know you recently had Taylor Swift. Uh, so for a given example for what that was like from a total throughput perspective. So yeah. about five years ago, you know, Mostly Wi-Fi was used by operations and backup house. So to ensure our corporate uh, functions operated on Wi-Fi. And as time has changed, the, the, the actual requirements from our fans is just being connected anytime they're in the stadium. 
to be connected to their friends, to be streaming what they've seen. So you mentioned Taylor Swift. Well, our usage on the Taylor Swift concept was 47 terabytes of data on just our free Wi-Fi every night. And, on, and in addition to that, you have the 5G network, right? But this was just on our free net, Wi-Fi network. So the demand and the request from our fans is that once they're in here, they need to be connected. And without connectivity, we get a lot of complaints. Wow, 47 terabytes is remarkable. And do you notice a difference in the way people use the network and the types of services they have in a concert versus a sporting event? Yeah, we find that concerts is a lot more, lot more uptake of the free Wi-Fi compared to a sporting event. Sporting event, a lot of people are still engaged in what's happening on the field, whereas for a concert, they're streaming. As soon as they get in, the artist comes on stage, the phones come out and they start streaming. I guess what you're dealing with there are the social implications of concerts. Everyone needs to let everyone else know that they're at the Ed Sheeran or Taylor Swift concert so they can show their friends that they're there and it's live and it's up to you to deliver that. So I can certainly see what you're dealing with there. Now, I read recently that the Melbourne Cricket Ground signed an investment with Cisco as part of your Smart Stadium 2.0 for project. Before you get into that, though, can you go back a little bit? I know you had a Smart Stadium 1.0 infrastructure in place. And can you talk about what 1.0 was and why you felt the need to upgrade to 2.0 and what the motivation is behind that? Yeah, so Smart Stadium 1.0 was rolled out in 2013. So we went with a fully converged network that then rolled out our Wi-Fi and our IPTV. And then that has now outgrown. It's been over 10 years now. And then we just think that we are moving to a state, smart stadium 2.0, which is moving to a SDA network with, with an enhanced Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, and a better IPTV. So we're trying to mitigate a, you know, the throughput, the seamless integration, and then offering a bit more of uh, I suppose flexibility to to our, our platform to our stakeholders. So our stakeholders can be anybody from a concert promoter to an to an AFL sporting club or to cricket. And then the demand that comes from there is they want to use more and more of the micro segmentation of the network. So we move into smart stadium. 2.0 will allow us to do that micro segmentation so that each team gets their own VPN and each each segment of the network. So to be clear, you're enabling a series of parallel virtual networks so each occupant of the stadium can have their own private network within the broader physical network. Yeah, so we have teams that come in here and you know we could guarantee them that the, their communications are totally kept separate so they don't overlap each other. Thanks, that's uh, very innovative of you. I know because of security issues, facilities like yours are being mandated to find new ways of providing different services to various tenants. So c congrats on that. Now, what I found interesting about your deployment is that you're doing a complete end-to-end -end Cisco deployment. When I read about it, you're using them for stadium Wi-Fi, a full software-defined access network across the entire stadium. They're outfitting two data centers, providing the security, the collaboration, IPTV, and it's all being supported by Cisco CA services as well as capital. And so why was it so important to go end to end Cisco? Yeah, so when we were when we were deciding to go to tender, one of the key factors for us was from a management perspective, we needed a one point of contact. And then so that there was going to be no finger pointing, right? If there's an issue, I mean, the worst thing is somebody blaming the network or the other person blaming the IPTV or the Wi-Fi, right? This way, there's there's no no finger pointing. We know where to go, and there's one vendor, and it's easy for us. Yes, thanks. I actually think you might be one of the largest one Cisco deployments, at least that I'm aware of, as you are deploying almost everything that they have. Now, you talked about the value proposition of the single finger to point to, but do you see value in being able to integrate across the different technology areas, such as networking and security, or collaboration and networking? This is a couple of examples. What does a single vendor infrastructure bring you? It, it does. It makes it makes our lives a lot easier for my team from a maintenance perspective. And then just the escalation point is so much easier for us. Just, just knowing who to call and where to go. And then Cisco has been very proactive in, in partnership with us. So they, they do have a 
like an innovation lab that's set up at the MCG that, that they use. So oh. it gives an advantage to see what's on the roadmap and what, what's coming next. Wow, having an innovation center inside the stadium is uh, certainly unique. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen that before anywhere else. Now, with respect to the upgrade, how do you see the network being able to drive different experiences for the various stakeholders, such as fans, operations teams, or other guests that might be in the facility? Uh, what I'm looking for, I guess, is what's the vision of Smart Stadium 2.0 and what kind of things can you do with it that you could not do before? Yeah, we were hoping that we can offer a, a, a network that's so stable and guaranteed, but we can also be able to customize the requirements of different stakeholders, right? So it will be flexible enough for us to be able to provide the requirements that are specific to a particular team, to a particular stakeholder, to one of our contractors, like a food and catering contractors. They might have different requirements. That for them, the, one of the things that we're working on is the grab and grow stores. So we'd be able to segregate that and give it to them specifically for the catering vendor for that. That makes sense. I know grab and grow has grown massively in popularity as a way to reduce congestion at different congestion points. Uh, it's certainly great innovation, but it's completely network dependent. If that's not working, you're going to have a much bigger problem on your hands as patrons can't buy food or beverages. So uh, let's shift topics a bit here. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you about that two letter word that everyone's talking about now, which is AI. What are you thinking about with AI and how are you thinking about using it for uh, fan engagement operations and so on. So we currently have AI rolled out as part of our walkthrough scanners at our entry point. So we do 100% scanning of patrons coming into the, and we've got scanners that have AI enabled platform that actually scans objects and is based on density of the object. It's not well how the how the object is um, is made out of metal, but it's any density and it then highlights and sends alarms to us to say who we can do manual checks on. But AI has enhanced that part of a seamless entry into the stadium. But AI from an operation perspective is helping us do our attendance predictions. So we, we feed a lot of data into an AI model that looks at weather, time of game, traffic, and similar games for the last seven years and gives us accurate predictions of the numbers that are going to be attending, but the time of attendance and at which gates. So we can staff those gates accordingly. I like that. That's a very interesting way uh, to be using AI. It's a way to uh, almost predict and manage flow from people. But uh, when you look ahead, there's lots of new technology coming between mixed mode reality, uh, generative AI. Uh, are there some things that excite you? So uh, if you look around the corner, what types of technologies excite you most and what, what oh, they can do for the future? Yes, I'm really looking to, with a rapid emergence of AI, I'm just waiting for the day where we could merge EI, which is the most emotional intelligence with AI, right? So that will help me from an operations perspective, gauging a fan's emotion state, emotional state, where we could proactively then have security if we needed to, but if the mood changes, but we'll be able to personalize the offering we offer fans when they come in, depending on the emotional and if the team's winning and, you know, there's high emotions, we could, we could tailor the offerings to at that stage at a very real time offering. Fan emotions. That's uh, not one I've heard before from a sports CIO or anyone else. And I think it's super interesting. All teams have ups and downs and it'd be, uh, interesting to be able to measure the mood of the fans at all times. I know it's important to the teams, but maybe you can give them a bit of a heads up or something so uh, they can do something about it in advance. So thanks, Ray. That was a great conversation, and I certainly appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, and from an ER perspective, uh, yeah, perspective of solos, we are also then collecting a lot of data on team performance and things like that and feeding that back, right? So from to enhance the teams that play here, we can offer that sort of data that other stadiums which probably don't have. Yeah, you could offer that to the visiting teams as well, I suppose, right? Uh, as a, almost like a league-wide initiative. I'm curious, though, that within the AFL and uh, the cricket leagues, are a lot of these decisions done at a team level? Are they done at a league level? Or is it some combination of both? 
So from a, from a stadium perspective, we don't have a home team that's based at the MCG. So we, we have five Canon teams that play out of here. And then we could have four games from four different Canon clubs over four nights. So, so we need to make sure the stadium is able to switch across to different teams from night to night and, and technology helps us do that. Five teams. I mean, most of your US-based counterparts only have to deal with one team. So uh, you're a busy guy, it sounds like. <laughs> Thanks, sis. Well, I certainly appreciate your time today. It's been a pleasure, sir. And then may I offer that if anybody is visiting Australia, please look us up. We'll be, we'll be happy to host you at another stadium. Well, I certainly hope people take you up on that. I'll make sure I include your name and LinkedIn uh, address in the YouTube description below. And if anybody's interested, give Ray a shout. Sounds good to me. All right. So on behalf of Ray Samaro from the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, I'm Zias Caravalo from ZK Research. Thanks for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on the next episode of ZCast. Thank you so much, Ray.